Welcome to part two of buying a used 4x4, four four, four wheel drive. I'm here at Midland Auto Plus, Torben's mechanic who looks after Torben's vehicle. Um, if you don't know who Torben is, that's him. Anyway, so I'm here to get some expert advice because this guy here, Chris at Auto Plus, he has seen so many vehicles, so many four drives and normal cars come through here. I've had a brief look in his workshop. There are quite a few in there, petrol and diesel. So we're going to show you guys what to look out for, all the specific parts of the vehicle, and to look for some tricky situations as well. For example, mining, ex-mining vehicles. We're gonna cover a lot of stuff here. So get your notepads out and stay tuned. So we're inside the workshop now, and I'll get Chris to come in so I can introduce him. Chris, how are you, mate? Hey, mate. Chris here, uh, you also do vehicle inspections here. Uh, so if someone gets like a yellow sticker, that's like a vehicle defect. Uh, they come in here and you got to go through the whole car and could be various reasons, couldn't it? Yeah. So you see a lot of stuff basically. Yeah. There's a pretty big shop too. You've got an old 80 here, you got a BMW there. So yeah. just everything, eh? Everything, yeah. Everything. We don't specialise in everything and specialise in nothing. Okay. So. Cool. <laughs> Alright. So you don't discriminate in cars? No, definitely not. <laughs> What we're going to show you here is a very comprehensive guide to go through. Now, we're going into a lot of detail, a lot of detail. So, get your notepen out and just keep replaying the sections you need to play. Maybe even bring this, uh, your phone with you and run this clip while you're going through the vehicles. We have some essential tools here, so I'll let you take this. So, if you're going to run through this very minor basic toolkit you need to come out and check a car. Well, I think most important, the torch. So you can get, when you're up underneath the car, you can see where you might not necessarily be able to see and you can have a really good look, looking inside under the dash, etc. So only a simple thing, but a good thing to have, or you can use the torch on your phone. A couple of screwdrivers for later on when we're looking at the intake yep. and, and checking the battery fluid, etc. cetera. Uh, and then a rag. If you want to wipe things down or clean your hands, you want to check the fluid, so the oil, power steering, whatever it is you're checking, you can wipe it on here and instead of your shirt. Or if you can't find any rags, you're out of rags because you, you like working on cars at home, just grab your missus top <laughs> when she's not looking. Well, let's get straight into it then. Let's go. Cool. To start off with, we're gonna do some obvious stuff, but Chris is gonna let us know about some uh, telltale signs where you can check if the vehicle's been resprayed. So we're gonna start with the exterior of the vehicle. We're gonna look at the paintwork, we're gonna look for dents, we're gonna look for tires sticking out of arches, we're gonna look at windows. So let's get into that. You wanna start with the paint? Yeah, just quickly with the paint, probably just look for different shades of color and opening and shutting the doors and looking for maybe one colour on the inside and maybe a slightly different colour on the outside. That's, that's a good point actually. Could be a good sign that it's been, been changed. Would you recommend even moving the, uh, the rubber seals, a little, you know, the ones that are easier? Yeah, definitely, definitely, because sometimes I'll just paint up to the rubber seal, so you peel that back, have a look behind it, you might find it's a different colour, could be a telltale sign. Okay, uh, and then I suppose uh, with gaps in the panels too? Yep, definitely, especially if the gap's not even or it's bigger on one door than the other. And just with general dents as well, I mean, we can see one here, and you know, it's not, I mean, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna say that the car's not good, but it can help you in price later on. <laughs> you wanna have a look if it's got a legal tint or bubble tint. Bubble that's tint, be... so it needs new tint, doesn't it? Is there an easy way to tell if the tint is illegal? I mean, it's pretty hard, isn't it? With, without a tin tester, and it's not a it's not a real rule, but generally if you look, if both windows are up, looking through one side to the other, you can get a good idea. If you can't see clearly through both windows, it could be an indication that it's too dark. Probably too dark. Yeah. Some of this will probably seem obvious to some people, but it's a good reminder for you. So Chris, uh, should we do the door thing? Yeah, just as you say, it does sound obvious, but checking even just opening and shutting a door, just seeing if it drops when you open it. Could be a sign it could have worn hinges or it hasn't been put back on properly. And make sure that it shuts properly, that it shuts nice and smooth, that it's actually all yeah. behind. And the door handle too, if it's... Um... Definitely. Would and you... the inside one. And the inside, yeah. yeah it's I always forgot this, about yeah. it. 
That's probably something that a lot of people would forget about is the inside. You don't go inside and open it. Yeah, mm. until someone gets in the car and then they're like, oh, I can't get out. Yeah, I've so, already bought it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and the wheel arches, if your tyres are sticking out, that could mean that the uh, tyre that's on it um, is too big, which can often be the case with a previous loved four-wheel drive vehicle. Uh, so you may need to extend the guards out because you could pull straight out of here and get done by, done by the cops, essentially. I'm pretty sure most countries, you have to have the guard, the wheels within the guard. Where's the telltale sign for rust on, on gutters? Let's just talk about rust in general. Rust first, you, you would look closely around in mm. all the spots where water can, water can sit or where it hasn't been cleaned properly. Yeah. Um, and in the gutters, normally I'm just climbing up on the side step and having a, a good look inside it. Sometimes too, you've got to be careful. But if the, the strips are a bit loose, sometimes you can just move them back and see that it's actually corroded on the inside of it. Okay. And then the actual chrome so trim is sitting properly, yeah. Uh, you couldn't see it unless the trim was off. And with doors, rust tends to sit down the bottom, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah, so when you've got it open, if the, if the drain plugs are blocked in the bottom of the door, and so they're not draining the water out, and then it, the water's going to sit in there and then it's going to rust out. And it's, it's actually quite common too on a four-wheel drive that those will be blocked. Say if someone's been stuck in a, in a bit of a mud bog for a while, water makes its way into the vehicle and into the door trim because it will just go through here after a while. So the vehicle we're actually looking at here is an 80 series Land Cruiser. Just thought we'd better mention that. Chris, you pointed out just before the rust here. Do you want to, like, is, do, you, do you think it might just be this little bit here or do you think there could be some nasties hiding behind here? Yeah, so it's always a good spot to look. Around the window seals, it's always a, probably one of the first spots I'd look because of where it can start to build. And if you can see it like that, there's probably a really good chance that a lot of the actual channel behind this seal is going to be rusted as well. So that's not so much of a problem now, but if this green gets cracked or the seal really starts to leak and this has got to come out, then you could have a problem trying to reseal it again because it'd be too much rust. So that's, I guess that's another point to look at. Yeah, this, Just see if the trailer plugs are right. It's probably not the best example because this has a lot of surface rust on it. But another good trick is um, just with the trailer plug is opening it up and have a look. And sometimes you see there's a lot of rust in it mm. inside the trailer plug. It doesn't mean death, but it could be a sign that maybe they backed the boat into the water. And then the trailer plug is getting a lot of salt yeah. water. And it's not a sign. Water and... it, an easy yeah. way to, to see without climbing right under the vehicle that it... Uh, it might be an early indication to, hey, I'm, I really do need to check underneath. Definitely. Yeah. But this kind of, I mean, this kind of rust here will be pretty common. But, I mean, there's a lot here really, isn't there? I mean, this is fairly rusted, this, this bracket. It is, yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of surface on it. It's nothing that's going to cause a, it's nothing that's going to cause an issue. That could be depending on where the car yeah. has lived all its life. So the whole thing about full drive and not passenger vehicle, you need to get up high. And I'm standing on the back of the vehicle now. So I can see what's on the roof. So on the roof, it's a bit, it's not like a passenger vehicle, you can just look over. We're up here, um, noticeably I can see two dents. And what you need to look for are dents and paint fade. But Chris, anything else you want to add to that? Um, probably just look that the vehicle hasn't been used for uh, something where it needed something on the roof. Like a not might need a beacon or a sign or something like that, and for that they might have had to drill a hole in the roof. Oh, like a pilot vehicle or something. That's right. And and then once they've removed everything, they've got a hole there, so they might have had to silicon that up, touch it up. Could be an issue in the future. Could be have water leaking in. So something you want to check. So it's something you could be on top of. We're now looking at suspension components uh, and the underside, the undercarriage for oil leaks. And this is a perfect car actually to look for all the stuff because we've got a bit of everything here. <laughs> we have, we got a mix. Let's start with the exhaust because you showed me something I didn't really think about, but um, you, sp you also spotted a hole over here. Yep. Right so there. Nice hole straight through it. And you were mentioning about bashing the, hitting it. Yeah, so maybe even just looking at this muffler, sometimes you can just look at it and externally it looks okay, but it could actually be breaking up and rusting inside, or if it's a catalytic converter, it could be doing the same thing. And just looking at it, you're not going to know, but give it a good, give it a good whack. If you hear it rattling around or things shaking inside, yeah. it could be a chance saying that something's broken up inside the muffler. Something else I noticed when you did that was um, all the mounts and joins are, you can kind of see if they're loose as well. 
Um, now, obviously, we have a hoist here, so it's a lot easier for us to, to do this, but it's just so we can show you exactly where to go. And four-wheel drives, we're higher off the ground, so you, you, can, you can get under there. So I'll probably suggest that they wear like clothes I don't really care too much about. Definitely. Just to get under it. And go yeah. for it, just get under there. Just, yeah, just get under it and get your hands dirty. Yeah. Oil leaks. Right here, transfer case oil leak. Or gearbox. It's coming from somewhere here. So, I mean, that's a decent leak. Yeah. And at the end of the... Well, that's the gearbox, isn't it? Right here. Yeah. Another leak. So you can see where this is in the middle. Could be a rear main seal. And probably just with the oil leaks, like you say, you want to sort of you've got to be realistic in terms of the age of the, the car. It's going to be some oil. If yeah. there's just sweats and things like that, I don't think I'd be too concerned. But if you've got something that's actually like drips. Yes, like noticeably dripping that that's one. That's right. If, and if it's dripped, you know, is there enough fluid in the transfer case? Has it been topped up? Has it been running low? That, that'd be something things I'd want, to ask, I'd want to ask next. Okay. But also, depending on where the oil leak is, I mean, if it's the main seal, I mean, that's, that's a bit of a job to do that. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Uh, so I suppose your other seals on your diffs, um, drive shafts. Now, you don't need to be a mechanic to, be, to know if there's something wrong. I'm not, I'm not a mechanic. I'm certainly not going to claim to be either. But, um, you know, after full driving for quite a while, there's a few things I noticed. Like when I bent my drive shaft, I could see there was like an X on it because the way it twists yeah. so you get like a you get like a like an x like a crossway x on a drive shaft that means it's been um, um well it's been sitting on it it's bottomed out on it and they've actually grinded against it to go forwards and backwards that could also indicate a dent and a dent in a drive shaft is not great no. it's an 800 hundred dollar job on a 70 series <laughs> so you don't need anything special but if you got your rag just grab the uni joints Hold, hold the diff end, hold the shaft end, side to side and up and down and just check if any of the uni joints have got play. And oh, even yeah. while you're there for that matter too, grab the whole lot because you want to see if the diff pinion's got any play. Okay. And if it's got a lot up and down, that's something I'd want to address. Okay, so a bit like cheering, checking your wheel bearing, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. So you checking wheel bearing, left to right, up to down. That one's fine, but if you get movement or play, um, a tiny bit, what would you say about a tiny bit of play? Uh, a tiny bit, I wouldn't be too concerned. Yeah, about. it's more yeah. like if, if it's, it's real like dunk, you can dunk, notice dunk, it dunk, like and you that. can see it, yeah, then you've got to worry. But I mean, you might get tiny play in some, because you can't always tighten right up. Because sometimes too tight, it's going to be worse too than, that, tight, yeah. than that little bit. Checking the suspension and this one here has a dent, which we noticed after we saw this, um, bit of sweating, which could indicate a leak, eh? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I suppose after we noticed this, I had a close look at the shock and then we noticed it was dented. So this might have something to do with it, maybe not. Um, but yeah, it's substantial, isn't it? And you can see how it's, see how it's catching all the dirt. So it's, it's sweating down, the oil is sweating down and then it's picking up all the dirt and sticking it to it. Mm. So it doesn't always do that. So don't always expect to see the dirt. Sometimes you just want to put your finger on it, see if and you see can if feel the oil, yeah. feel the oil on it, because they might not have gone in dirt. And what, what would this indicate? That that could indicate that this shock's pretty much done for. The seals are leaking. Yeah. yeah. So if the seals are leaking, probably a good chance it's losing its rebound. And uh, we'll probably talk a bit about that after how you can see that on your tyre. Yep. I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll get onto tyres straight after this bit. Uh, is that brake fluid? Yeah, it is, yeah. So that's the proportioning valve. And uh, you can see that's leaking some brake fluid on it, so that's definitely not something that you want. So Chris was just telling me something about how to find out if his plane is steering, and it's pretty cool actually, but it's something you're probably not going to worry about until you've test driven it and then you notice something in the steering. Yeah. yeah. So do you want to run us through it? Because there's no way I can repeat what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if you get a feeling that there's Steering wheel, steering wheel feels a bit floaty or like there's a bit of play in it or you move the steering wheel before the car actually changes direction. It's a bit of a lag. Um, throw someone in the driver's seat while you've got it down on the ground. You're going to get them to move the steering wheel side to side. Checking the bushes basically. 
if there's and you you are inside you're checking these joints yeah. so the tie rod ends track rod ends etc sometimes if there's enough play in it we've had it before where we're doing an inspection off site you're moving the steering wheel without even touching it you just stick your head under there and you can actually see I this. Can see it. You can just see this going like that. Dunk, 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 backwards and forwards. Massive plane oh, wow. steering. Even if you're not sure what you're looking at, if you can see damage, damage, anyone can see damage. If there's shiny metal, uh, there's oil, there's dents, have a closer look. That's indications for you to have a closer look and question things. So what are your top things for checking with the chassis? Um, I mean, rust is obviously one of them. You always want to get surface rust on a chassis. Yeah. But at what point do you start worrying? Uh, when you start to get like a bubbling and pitting where it's actually starting to eat away at the metal. Yeah. And the other thing too in the chassis, you're looking for cracks. So without being too vehicle specific, some models more than others are prone to getting cracks in the chassis. Probably a quick Google search, you'll see which ones. Yeah. Have a look in those spots. Yeah, that's, that's a good point actually. Especially in your, was it your Triton, Navara? Yeah. And ute patrols. Yeah. All very common for cracks. And it, it, it's something you don't have to necessarily get it up on the hoist to be able to see. You just have to know where to look. Know where to look, yeah. And you can see if someone's tried to fix okay. it or if it's got the crack there. And that's where all the research in part one, that's why you did that. So you know <laughs> what to look for. Now, there's a lot of um, obvious things about tyres, but there's a lot of things that people skip and don't really think about. Um, we do have the vehicle up on a hoist, but it's generally pretty easy to get around a four-wheel drive tyre. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, usually more clearance, even on a stock vehicle. So, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so this tyre is probably not the best example. It looks pretty good. Mm. To me, just looking at it quickly, if I just had the quick assessment of the tyre, but something I'd be looking at, um, first of all, wear on the inner and outer edges, if it's cut out. So say this part of the tyre here has all got a lot of tread and this side here is worn right in. Then we've so, got a wheel alignment problem that's or right. something. Had it before too where it's, it's cutting out one side because the diff's bent. So maybe they've done a oh. jump or something, bent part of the diff. You can't adjust that out of it. Yeah. Because there's no adjustment there's, for there's it. Because there's that much. Yeah, so then it just kills that inside of the tyre. Okay. So just looking at the tyre could be a sign of something bigger. If the middle's worn mostly, that means it's, it's run too much PSI in it. Yeah. So it could fool you as well. But if the outside edges are worn heaps and the middle's not, then he's run them too low. Yeah. So that's something you can discount from mechanical uh, problems. So an example that Chris wanted to show us was um, something about shockies. Uh, and, uh, you, we're using the tire to see if the shocky is, is worn. Yeah. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, so sometimes we might look at the suspension. The suspension looks okay but the tyre might be telling us different. So looking at this tyre here on the outer edge of the tyre. It's a strange wear, isn't it? It is, yeah. See how, it's, how this part of it's stepped mm. and this part's low? So, so is, is it, it jumping? Yeah, we've got highs and lows on the tyre. So it's generally called scalloping. And basically what's happening is the shock's not allowing the tyre to maintain complete contact with the road all the time. So okay. whilst you might not feel it, the tyre's like this and that's what causes that wear. That'll kill the tyre. Eventually it'll get really scalloped and four-wheel drive tyres can be noisy as they are, but you know, you get that wool, wool, wool. Mm. That that's the telltale sign. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, I mean, that's pretty clear here. That's very clear here. Yeah, you do, this one's on the outside, so it's quite obvious. So when you're checking... Feel the inside. Yeah, definitely. And the yep. outside, the ins, actually the uh, inside's got it too. It has, yeah. yeah. So just don't be afraid to get the hands dirty, feel it. And yep. if you can feel those highs and lows in there. Scalloping too, it's not always suspension. It can be a dodgy tire or separating tire or something like that. But okay. there's a good chance I'd be looking nine at, times at out of 10, it's gonna be shockies or something like that. Okay. The spare tire. The spare tire can tell you a lot of stuff about the vehicle. For example, if this spare tire is not the same brand as this one, which they're not, this is a, what's this one, a Yokohama? Yokohama, yeah. And this one here is a Dunlop. So they're not the same. That'll, that'll tell me he doesn't rotate the tyres with five. He might rotate with four. The other thing that's going to prompt me is to check the size then. 
So you, you should be able to just look under. If it's the same brand tyre, more than likely the same size. But if you want to get under there and have a look at the size, it's probably a good idea. And this size is different, I'm pretty sure. Uh, 275-70-R16. And this one here was a... 265-75-16. Yeah, so pretty close. But you, you, want to, you want to check because if this guy was running 33s, and he had 31 stock size, which will only just fit under here anyway, then um, you, you don't want to be using that as a spare on your vehicle because if you do a tyre and then you put that on and you're on four-wheel drive, it can cause bind-up through the whole system. Um, and if you, if you do have to do it, put it on the front and not the back and put it in two-wheel drive. Then you will avoid the uh, bind-up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you just pulled the owner's manual out, so I'll let you take that one because that's that's a good one. Yeah, so just probably what, what I'm looking for with the owner's manual first and foremost. Sometimes we get trapped looking in the manual or the service book for service stamps and uh, how often they've been serviced, etc. I'm probably not really too concerned about the service book more than what I'm concerned with looking at actual invoices looking actually where it's been serviced and what's been used. Okay. So always check this and see yeah. that it has been filled out, but don't use it as the holy grail that it has. Yeah. Because I've seen it before where it's just been, it's been dolly. Doc doctored? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I mean you see all kinds of things here. Yeah, seen it before and they go, it's, it's all been filled out and on closer inspection it's the Looks like it was all filled out on the same day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then looking at the rest of the car on yeah. the time, it definitely didn't have a service history that what was reflected in the book. Okay. And well, that is uh, reflecting on the vehicle from the book. That's another good point because what about the odometer? If the odometer is really low, but the, the inside is like this, because I'm at a guess the odometer is like, 200, 300,000, being yeah. the, the age of the vehicle. Yeah. That's what I'll be expecting out of something like this. But yeah. if, it's, if it says a lot lower and the condition of the car's like this, then there's probably a good indication there's something going on there. Yeah, definitely. Or well, the guy's been sleeping in the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, checking under the seats is a good one. Then you can see what the condition of the seats. Now I'm not gonna pull all this off, but it's a good way to, to check the seats. Um, I guess the steering wheel. Steering wheel, yeah. Sometimes you can see like, it's just the point you make with the odometer. We've had it before where the odometer might maybe say... Wound back or something? Well, necessarily, but possibly maybe it could have been changed. That's another thing that happens too. It's not oh, the dash changed. Yeah, it's not necessarily that someone's gone out of their way to make the odometer lower. Maybe a cluster's failed, so I've put a second-hand one in with lower kilometres. With the um, odometer, do you know what it looks like when someone's doctored it too? No. Um, it's not 100%, but... A lot of the time when it has been done, you can see it because the numbers never all line up properly. Okay. So you know all the ones that are supposed to be lined up? So yeah. So you've got the one that are always turning. The other ones... They might slightly They sit out. slightly scattered because it's been clicked over. Okay. But they don't sit back right in exactly the same spot. They look a bit scattered. The clutch pedal on a manual vehicle, if that's worn, there's a, that's a good indication that he's been resting his foot on the clutch. So... Not maybe, good. <laughs> yeah, so maybe check the clutch on your, on your test drive. I mean, you probably want to do that anyway. Definitely. Let's see the condition of the, the actual carpet, not, not just the floor mat. Uh, look for watermarks. Uh, I guess move the seat and see if there used to be an amp there or if there is an amp there now for like your stereo. Because uh, the guys who install those kind of things, they, they tend to just drill straight through the floor. So if it's pulled out, water's just going to come through the bottom. If, yeah. you, if you're stuck somewhere for a bit. And, and while you're looking for that, look for the telltale signs of a, a mine spec vehicle. So the red dust under the seats, really get into the carpets where you can lift up and behind the covers. Look around the B pillar for any possible holes that have been in the carpet that have been fixed. Okay. Could be a sign that it had rollover protection in oh, it. Oh, like a been, roll, yeah. Yeah, it could have a roll bar in it and it's been taken out. Holes that have been plugged, like lots of holes that have been plugged or wiring in the dash that's now no longer used. So it could have been fitted out with something for, not necessarily mining, but as an yeah. example, and then it's all been taken out, and I've just left those things in there, it could be a sign. So another indicator to maybe 
look deeper. Check if it is a miner's vehicle. Yeah. And we'll, we'll touch on specific miner's vehicle um, a bit later in this video too. Windows, I suppose, well, because I just noticed there's a crack in this windscreen. You should probably pick that up in the exterior of the vehicle. Uh, but yeah, there's a noticeable crack there. The ceiling too. Now, if the ceiling's like a uh, fabric ceiling, this ceiling in here is, is vinyl, but I noticed in my ceiling, my ceiling's fabric. It's the first, second vehicle I've had with fabric ceiling, and that red dust just sticks to it. You cannot get it out. So a lot of time you get in a vehicle, you're looking down at everything. You don't look up. Yeah, So true. definitely look up. Yeah. The heart of the vehicle the engine bay, and this area is intimidating to a lot of people, to probably 90% of people when they go look at a car, this is the area, it's like, oh, what do I look at? Don't fear, we're going to give you some good pointers here. Well, I think Chris is going to give you most of them, because I'm not a mechanic. When you first open it, it's just have a general look. If the whole engine bay is completely dirty, like it has not been cleaned for a long time, then it kind of, it, it may tell you a bit about the owner, not looking up at the, the car in general, if the whole engine bay is dirty. And if there are some really clean areas in the engine bay, but it's generally dirty, it could be an indication that something has been cleaned on purpose or, or, or fixed recently or, or something like that. First things we always check with the engine bay first to just keep it simple and that's all the basics. So first of all, fluids, or all of them. So engine oil, we're having a good look at the engine oil, we're going to pull the dipstick, see that it's full, check the condition of the oil, make sure it's the right colour, that doesn't look like it's milky or something like that. Um, I think you're saying before with a diesel you're not always going to tell just by looking at the colour if it has been changed. Yeah, because um, I mean they can, they can still be dirty once you change the oil. With some or most diesels, nature of the engine, you, we can change the oil, take it for a test drive and check it again and it literally looks like it hasn't even been changed. That's not the case for every diesel, but a lot of the time it is, so you can't always just say that it is bad because it's black. Power steering, brake fluid, clutch fluid, you know, why do you want to check them things? Brake fluid, okay, so if the brake fluid's low and you can't see the pads, could be a sign that the brakes are low, could be a sign that a wheel cylinder's leaking, or in this case, that valve that we found leaking. Yeah. So even though it's only a, a fluid that's easy to top up, it could be pointing out something else that's wrong yeah and if you're going to check anything check it while the engine is not running check it when it's cold because you won't be able to open the radiator cap after it's been running for a while so you come back from your test drive that's going to hurt um <laughs> yeah and most of these containers uh, on the stick will have levels on it and on the um brake fluid or the transparent ones it has it on the side generally doesn't it yeah get trapped with them too when they're on the side some of them still just open them up anyway it's gonna be a bit deceiving looking on the side uh, oh because it could be like a like a high tide mark kind of thing yeah and it can the condition of the fluid sometimes it just it becomes covered on the side of it okay. so it looks like it's there but it's actually but it's not. not checking so you mentioned with the oil to check the the color and if it's milky and stuff what what other things that could be contaminating the oil to make it milky could that be, is that coolant that causes that or? No, we could have, if the vehicle's got an oil cooler, we could have mixing either way. So we could have oil getting into the coolant or coolant getting into the oil. Oh yeah, so check for oil in there too. Yeah, so taking off this, have a look. Uh, look around, have a good look at the cap. Sometimes you can see the residue of oil around the cap. But look at the texture, look at the colour. Yeah. If you can see oil in it. If you are going to buy a car, find out what kind of oil they use in here. If it's um, synthetic or, what's the other one? Uh, so you got mineral, semi-synthetic or full synthetic. Oh, so there's three. Yeah, and that's okay. a really good point because sometimes more, more so uh, than just the brand of oil, it's what oil was in it. What viscosity and... If that engine has used that oil all its life, yeah. you, I'd want to keep using the same oil. Okay. So even if I've got a preferred brand, if that's what it was always using, something that the engine's bedded into that, rather than changing the structure of the oil, putting something different in it, Okay. Keep the same one. Conditions of the hoses. Yeah. That's probably another good one, especially in an older car. It is, yeah. So you want to be feeling them, actually with this one here. So what, what, are, you, what are you feeling for? Are you feeling if it's too squishy? Yeah, this hose is crunchy. So crunchy could mean that we've got a build up inside, inside the system and it's actually sticking to the inside, inside of the, the hose. So 
it's going to be dirty. So that could it, there's scale build up. Uh, so also, if it's too soft. Is that usually calcium or something? Yeah. So and he's been it, putting water in it? Possibly. Possibly. Or just not servicing it. Okay. Not changing the coolant when you're supposed to. Not often enough. Yeah. Uh, belts, timing belts, um, pulley belts. To check those as well. I suppose we can go back to the, uh, the service book as well. Because say if the vehicle's done 180,000, because a lot of vehicles, they come up to 200,000. That's, that's a big service, right? That's worth looking at too, if you're coming up to, to an expensive job, um, just in general, really, isn't it? We find lots of cars, when they're coming up to the big service, might be the, the time that if you're thinking of selling it, is I when they get sold. Sell it before the big service. Yeah. Mm. Think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it took me no time whatsoever to take this air box, uh, get the air box open and check the air filter and what you're doing is you're checking for how dirty it is um, and you're checking for stuff inside as well bees leaves especially being off-road signs of water yes yeah, signs of water that's that's a that's a good one and the the drain bung if it's full of um, mud and grit and stuff that's one place um, a lot of people don't actually clean I've failed to do that on my own as well. I'll clean the airbox, but I always forget about the bung. So a lot of people who sell the car will forget about the bung. You can tell it might be an indication it's been through something. Beyond the air filter, right? Would you recommend sticking your hand through there and checking for dust? Yeah, so if, if an air filter has been fitted incorrectly or it's not sealing properly, the air filter, it can be bypassing the filter. And actually, while you're looking at that one, that's got an aftermarket air filter fitted. So it's mm. a perfect example of checking that the seal on the top is actually sealing properly. Is there yeah. anything getting past? Put your hand in there and you find a lot of dust. At what level of dust should you be concerned? Because I mean, there's always gonna be a little bit in there. Yeah, I don't like to see too much at all, but <laughs> yeah. if, if there's lots of dust, we've seen it before with incorrectly fitted air filters, and I've been driving on dusty roads and there's, there's lots in there, that would, be, that would be concerning. If I seen that though, I wouldn't necessarily stress at the start, I'd open up a bit further. Okay, and check further down. Yeah, there's like build up of dirt on the front, excessive build up. Uh, even just looking at the radiator, this one is a bit hard to see, but try and look in the core of the radiator and see if it's brittle. See if the fins are starting to come away, because you're going to be up for a radiator. Plastic tanks as well, like most of them these days. Have a look and see if the plastic looks brittle. If it's starting to darken and go brown and have lines in it that you can see. It's going brittle. You're gonna if it's really brittle, you're gonna be up for a radiator at some okay. stage soon. I guess also mud trapped between the air con air conditioning condenser and the and the radio is probably another one. Yeah, and if you got your torch and you just run it along the front there, you can see that. And looking at this one, it's nice and clean, and the core's the core looks good. The batteries. Now this is really easy for you to sort of detect yourself. If it's if it's a vehicle that's got a lot of accessories on it, look at the terminals. Nine times out of ten, the terminals have wires coming off everywhere. They're a, they're a big mess. That has to be sorted out. So keep that in mind. You will need to sort those terminals out because you're just asking for trouble. There's, there's volt drops, there's amp drops. Um, corrosion is another thing to look for. If it's green and black, chase down the wire. You may have to change the whole wire in some cases. Uh, has happened to me within a space of three years. So imagine a vehicle this age. Who knows? Check the electrics inside the vehicle. You may be up for a lot of cash or a lot of work to fix it out, to sort it out. So we're going for a test drive. It's pretty bumpy. We're not actually going to take it for a test drive because um, it's dark and we're stuck in a workshop. So, but we're gonna give you all the tips that you would need to know for a test drive. I'm, I'm in the driver's seat. Hands on the steering wheel. So I guess vibrations in the steering wheel is probably a good one. Yeah, so feel, feeling for vibrations. Also seeing how much travels may be in the steering. So like you said before, how far do you have to turn it before the car moves? Yeah. Is, is there play in the steering? Um, if you've got a safe enough road, it has to be clear, no other traffic. Just uh, maybe just load, swerving the car slightly side to side, that can pick up wheel bearing noises loading up the wheels oh really okay. noise in the car that you wouldn't necessarily hear if you're just just heading straight um but so, th th yeah i just don't want to be silly about it mm. but just loading up the wheel enough to put pressure on it 
just going down a straight, you can pick up those things. What kind of noises are you looking for, like a squeal or? Um, it'll be a, so a pitchy a tyre noise when you've got a tyre that's really loud or scalloped. It okay. could be that sort of noise, but a hum, and then it'll change. So the noise okay. will get louder or quieter. If it gets louder or quieter, it could be an indication that you're loading and unloading a bearing, and that's where the noise is. Investigate further. Yeah. Noticeable smoke at Noticeable the back. Noticeable smoke. Okay. Yeah. So don't want black smoke, don't want blue smoke, uh, don't want white smoke. But if you have got any of the smokes, probably black would be the least I'd probably worry about if it's Yeah, the least worry about. Yeah. Yeah. Just mean, yeah, you just means you're sooting on, on a diesel anyway. Yeah. If it's um, black smoke on a petrol, it's probably a bit of an issue. Yeah. And blue would probably be the one I'd most be worried about. Yeah. That'll, that'll be the rings, would it? Possible engine breathing, something like that. Next thing we're going to talk about are the brakes. So I'm guessing you do a lot of test driving with brakes from a workshop because that'll be like one, the number one thing you, you kind of check. Yeah. I'm definitely. guessing. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. So how would you check the brakes? Yeah, so d depending on what sort of feeling we're getting from the brakes when we test drive it, there is some checks we can do on the inside. One is to check the actual brake booster. Um, now the brake booster is generally not going to be a soft pedal. It's going to be a hard pedal. Okay. A pedal that you have to put a lot of pressure on before you can get the car to slow up. And just a quick way to check that, uh, put your foot on the brake with the car off keep pressure on the brake pedal, start the car up, your foot should drop. Not right down, but you'll feel the pedal go back. That's as the booster gets vacuum in it, it pulls the pedal back. It's a good sign straight away, okay, my, my booster's working. So right. I can rule that out as a possible issue. And if it doesn't move, then? Probably got a problem with the booster. With the clutch on a manual vehicle, how do you, how do you check if it's gonna slip the best way, like without obviously damaging the car you're test driving right yeah so the first thing we do straight away when we're testing a clutch is looking at where it bites before anything and two telltales straight away is the clutch biting too low or is the clutch biting too high because depending on the type of clutch you got it could be one or the other really maybe one inch two inches off the floor say about two is where it should be biting if you put it in gear and you just got your foot off the floor and it already went to, wants to take off, mm -hmm. something's out of adjustment. If you're letting the clutch out and you're right at the very top before it starts to grab and take off, something's out of adjustment or there's it's, a chance your clutch it's is slipping. Worn. And if the vehicle's cold, it's less likely to slip than if it's hot. Yep. Is that correct? Okay. And just why you, that's a good point, uh, you bring up cold and hot, you want to test the car in On a cold start. Yep. Mm. You've got to test it cold. If you've got the car for long enough while you're checking it, you want to allow it to warm up and then test everything warm. Yeah. Because it's going to be totally different. Some things will show up cold. Like your injectors on in a diesel engine, they will show up. Especially, uh, I spoke a lot about the the D4D Hilux engine. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had a few come through with injector problems? All the time. Yeah. Heaps. Yeah. So you get that rattle when it's cold. It sort of pitters out as it warms up. Mm. Yeah. Obviously, with your test drive as well, check your lights. So, hopefully, you've got someone with you, or you get the owner of the vehicle or the car dealer guy um, to sit in the car and then do all the lights for you so you can check all the lights, uh, brake lights, all that stuff. Your <clears throat> in uh, interior lights too, and your dash lights. Check all your gauges if they're all working. When you start the vehicle, let it run for a while and actually see what happens with the temperature gauges, make sure they actually work properly. The radio, I guess, you know, it's not a big thing, but... It's important. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta have tunes. You need some tunes. A cigarette lighter. That's, um, I've bought many cars where a cigarette lighter hasn't worked. Another thing. Uh, this one's really funny, actually. I bought a, um, this wasn't a four-wheel drive, but I bought a car once, and the guy was telling me, the car dealer guy, uh, it's a non-smoker's car. Yada, yada, yada. I didn't care, because he used to smoke back then. We were driving on the way home, had the old boy in the passenger seat, he opens up the ashtray. It's full of bloody cigarettes. <laughs> so, you know, um, just check the ashtray too. And then ask them, is it a smoker's or non-smoker's car? You never know. You know if the guy's lying. Car dealer guys always lie. Just always <laughs> think they lie. Make sure a heater and aircon's on while you're driving. Yeah, heater and aircon. Windows, power windows, check them all, the back ones as well. Check them from the seats as well. Because a lot of vehicles, the buttons actually go from 
uh, where the passengers sit. Um, because you know how you've got the four switches in the front? All the doors have switches as well. Just check them all. Make sure they all work. Because that, that's something that, that gets left out. So you also... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also recommend checking um, your full drive system too. So you could just go off a um, local ver verge or just anywhere where, where it's not tarmac really. You don't want to be testing on tarmac because yeah, you may bring a car back you don't want to buy then. <laughs> don't test on tarmac because you're buying up the, um, the, the system. But yeah, if you can find a, just a side of the road perhaps even, somewhere we can go forwards and backwards, maybe 30, 40, 50 meters would be ideal. Um, check high range. Check low range. If the vehicle has diff locks, definitely check those as well. Um, that is probably going to be a bit hard to, to test though, but you may be able to see if, if it engages. If it's air lockers and you keep hearing the compressor running, that means there's an air leak. Uh, with the mechanical lockers, they should be flashing on the dash if they're not in. If they're engaged, they should be a solid light. You just have to make sure they engage and disengage. If mm. you've done that, you're giving yourself the best chance that it's actually working. So many times we, we drive it, engage it, and then it, it won't engage. Or sometimes even before we've engaged it, and it has an issue, and then it's stuck. So we've brought the issue on, but we never would have known it if we hadn't have tried it. Yeah. And rather rather in your test drive than somewhere on the beach or somewhere yeah, like that. Yeah, definitely. Rather know then than the first time you take it out on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. That'll, that'll catch you out. Also, when you go, when you do test your full drive system, probably a good idea to, to grab the, um, the instruction manual so you know how to actually get it into full drive as well. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you'll be sitting there for a while. There's something Chris just mentioned about starting your car when you, um, you know, do the cold start thing, but um, you're mentioning that you should probably get someone else to start it and stand at the back, or if you're by yourself, make sure it's a neutral start it and then have a look at the back and what we're looking for again. What colour the smoke is and how much. Sometimes we, we can have a situation where it's only doing it on a startup situation and you start it up, you haven't looked out the back, taken it for a drive, you never even know what's there. Get the car home, the wife or the friend starts it up and you see it out the back and you're like, oh geez, it's, it's, it's blowing smoke. Let's talk about the OBD scanner onboard diagnostics. So with an OBD scanner, from what year did they start doing that? So think 19... come low in 97, 1997. Yeah, every vehicle after that year must have one. So basically, a scan gauge 2, which is in my vehicle, can be used for this, but you can even get the ones that um, Wi-Fi to your phone or Bluetooth to your phone. Uh, and that's a good way to check for e um, engine codes, perhaps. And what else would you use it to check? Depending on how complex the scanner you've got, try and scan all the modules. So ABS, SRS, could be indication if it's been in an accident and the codes haven't been cleared. Okay. Or it could just mean things have been disconnected and plugged back in and not cleared, but could lead you to something. Yeah, it could show something, yeah. So if you look, if you, if you can borrow one from a friend, or you're gonna buy one anyway, or you already have one from a previous vehicle, use that. It's not a, a, a must do, it's just a, uh, another good option. The X minor. So this is where I'll let you take off with this one. Yeah, so the, the X minor vehicle, so it can be a little trickier to pick up these, day, these days because the detailing jobs are, are so good. good. Yeah. Um, really what you want to be looking for on the vehicle is signs of, of red dirt. You've really got to look hard. Sometimes it can be painted, so you've got to take panels off or lift carpet up to be able to see. Uh, we touched on it before, looking for the holes inside the vehicle. A roll cage. Yeah. yeah, and maybe there was a roll cage fitted or wiring ran through. Obvious things like maybe an isolator switch on the bull part that might indicate that it was mine spec'd uh -huh. and now yes. it's been taken off. There's lots of things that, that need to be on the vehicle to be allowed to be on a mine site. Mine site yeah. And they're quick, easy things you can see. Okay. Um, they're obviously pretty good at the detailing because most mining vehicles, they have those reflective strips on the side. And I know when you see them in auction photos and stuff, you cannot tell the stickers been there. But I've ripped off stickers from cars before, and they stay there for so long. So they obviously go to a great length to detail them. Yeah, it can be depends on what light you look at it as well. But if they've peeled them all off, given it a good cut and polish, 
it you can be very it. hard to tell. So what is the main reason why you, you recommend not buying an ex-mining mining vehicle? Main reason would be is that the kilometres actually reflected on the car in terms of how much wear it has would be a lot more. So say the car's on 100, in real terms, it's yeah. probably have like 150,000 kilometres worth of wear on it. Okay. Such as the harshness that they have to go through. And plus the owners, the, the people who drive it don't actually own the car, so... <laughs> yeah. Drive it they like you borrowed it. it. Yeah, that, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or stole it. <laughs> or stole it. Yeah. <laughs> so I suppose with some of the ex-mining cars, I mean, you have the ones that spend their entire life underground and they're in low range. They're probably the worst ones to get, right? Because the salt levels down there are like three times ocean or even more perhaps. Yeah. But what about a supervisor's vehicle, like a Prado or something? Yeah, so might not necessarily spend as much time underground, but the roads and the tracks, a lot of the time they have to go on, could still be bumpy, rutted, and you've still got that dirt. Gets okay. into the suspension, gets in everything, wears it out quicker, rust, snapping bolts, things don't come off and on easy. Okay. It creates lots of headaches in the future. you just got to be like an investigator, really. Yeah. Look in all the spots that you wouldn't normally go to because that dust gets in everything. Get up under the dash there, have a look where it might not be able to be cleaned and see if you can look for signs. That's a good app, wouldn't it? I think we've given these guys enough. I think the video is long enough. That's, <laughs> that's what I mean to say. Um, but yeah, it's a long video. You've watched to the end. Thank you very much for watching. And thank you very much, Chris. No worries for uh, taking the time. Um, what is it now? It's, it's uh, nearly 10 o'clock. <laughs> so we've been here for a while. Um, so yeah, Midland Auto Plus, worthy of a plug for sure. There's so much information we've gotten here. So thanks again. Um, and if you guys would like to um, subscribe, you can do so right here. And if you'd like to support the creation of more videos like this, you can go to patreon.com slash Ronnie Dahl, or just click that link right there. Um, if you want to watch part one and part three of this series, they're just down here. And see the links below, and I'll catch you in another video.